turn in your Bible to the book of Ephesians, chapter 6. I appreciate your prayers. Uh, uh, how many know that the pollen still flat? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, I tell you, I've had a, a time this year. Usually uh, in spring, it's real bad. Uh, but it seems like this spring has just been extra bad. And my eyes are itching and it feels like I've got sand in them all the time. And, and I'm digging and can't get nothing out of <laughs> it. Smack myself so I cry and see if that'll work. <laughs> but God is good, and even with all this stuff that's going on, we've got a beautiful uh, Sunday that the Lord has blessed us with, and I want to just praise Him. We need to continue to pray for our country and for all that's going on around it. it Seems like one thing after another uh, happens, and as been mentioned, we can't hardly get. Uh, our prayer is done for one thing. When something else comes, we need to pray about it. Right. And certainly we, we live in a, uh, a time when that is something that is real to us that we need to continue to pray for. We're uh, in our uh, third part of the family series from Mother's Day to Father's Day. And today we're going to start with Ephesians chapter 6. But we'll not stay there. I've got to few places I'd like for us to go, and we're going to be talking about uh, children, God's gift. Children, God's gift. Now, uh, depending on how bratty your kids are, <laughs> you wonder how good a gift that is, right? If you ever receive a gift that you thought, what in the world were they thinking? <laughs> well, sometimes when, when I love it, I thought about this, and uh, one of, one of the boys said a statement like this a number of years ago. We were talking about babies, how cute they were. And then uh, one of them said, yeah, just like uh, German Shepherd, they grow up. Yeah. And, you know, they'll bite your head off after a while. And so, yeah, they're real cute when they're little, but boy, watch them grow. Yeah. But they, that's all part of it. Remember what you were like. That's fine. Amen. Amen. Uh, Ephesians chapter 6, verses 1, 2, 3, and 4, to get started with. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and thy mother, which is the first commandment, with promise, that it may be well with thee, and that thou mayest live long on the earth. And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we exalt your name and your kingdom to come in power and authority and blessing, Father, for each one that hears today. I pray, Master, that the stirring of the Holy Spirit be in their heart and that the lives of God and they can feel your touch and know your presence is real, Father. We talk about people having a zeal and, uh, uh, for God, but Lord, not according to knowledge. And I pray. Uh, Father, that those that say they have the goods also have them, God, according to your word. In reality, Father, it doesn't matter how sincere a person is. If they're wrong, they're sincerely wrong. And I pray, God, that your word would speak to our heart today that we might be sincerely and earnestly right, each one, to know your will. Touch us and draw us closer to you. Give us presence. Give us strength, Father. Give us soundness of heart and mind. Your word might speak to our heart. We're going to love you for it in Christ's name. And amen. Well, Ephesians 1, uh, chapter 6, 1 through 4, uh, talks about uh, children, obey your parents in the Lord, uh, because that's the proper way that things ought to be. He said, for this is right. And that's the way it should be. Parents, uh, when you have children, you uh, bring them up. They're babies. And they need uh, nurturing, they need strength, and they need everything that you can possibly give them to help them to mature and to grow into a complete, honest, and open, uh, ethical, responsible adults. Uh, and that's the, the purpose and desire of any right-thinking mom or dad. Is that not correct? That you want your children to grow up with the right kind of a mindset uh, they care about one another and their family and their community and be a good citizen. Amen. And so he said, honor thy father and thy mother, which is the first commandment with promise, 
And so it is the first commandment that's taken from Exodus chapter 20 and verse 12, where it says, Honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long upon the earth, uh, the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. And so it's a promise from God uh, that children obey their parents, and uh, they promise, uh, the first commandment would promise, uh, we have a lot of thou shalt not, and then we get to uh, uh, the uh, fifth commandment, where he said, honor thy father and thy mother. And it's a, a commandment with promise that God has blessed us with. Now, you may not agree with me in this statement, and uh, that's okay. You can be wrong if you want to. But I believe that parents have a greater responsibility uh, than government and nations do when it comes to family. I believe parents have a greater responsibility when God allows a child or a grandchild to come into their home that they have the God-given honor and responsibility to bring them up in the fear and admonition of the world. If they are raised properly and right and godly in the home from day one, then whenever they get old enough, they'll be good citizens of the government. They'll be good citizens of the world. Amen. Today, whatever the government and the world's got going, but they'll be right. Amen. They'll be right. The rest of the world will be wrong, but they'll be right. So you've got a greater responsibility than the president of the United States or any other government. Amen. When it comes to children, children are our greatest asset. And they are our greatest responsibility. <clears throat> Each child has great uh, accountability uh, from the parents that are trying to teach them right. And they also have children have the greatest potential uh, that they can become. If you will encourage and nurture them in such a way they can, they can become the best them they can be. Yes. Whatever that is. Amen. Uh, the Bible said, train up a child in the way that they should go, and when they get old, they'll not depart from it. And so we don't bring them up in the way we should have them go, but the way that they should have them go. I had that explained in Scripture one time, uh, that when we bring up a child in the way that they should go, is the way that God has uh, mixed them and formed them and ordained them as a perfect human being, and they're a unique human being, uh, they're made in the likeness of God. Uh, they're also made in the likeness of their parents and all of their family. But my friend, that God has placed within them uh, something that is particular, something that is special, something that is unique, that is only theirs. And if we bring a child up in the way that they should go, and we're conscious of the way that they are, and their understanding, and the way that they are, artful, scientifically, Physically, amen, everything that makes that child unique, if we bring them up in that way, they'll be the best them that they can be. I had another fellow say uh, one time to me, he said there are three parts uh, to the human body. There are the physical, there's the mental, and then there's the spiritual. And all of those things need to be uh, balanced out, amen. We need to bring them up physically. They need to be healthy and, and strong, and that includes food and exercise. And everything else, we need to bring them up mindfully. Uh, they need to have the understanding and teaching uh, that is good for them, for whatever schooling and whatever arts and performance that there are. And then there's the spiritual part of it. As parents, we need to bring our children up in the fear and admonition of the Lord. And so God has given us such a great uh, responsibility and on judgment, accountability as to how that we have raised and nurtured our children and brought them up in this world. And so God called children a true light and a blessing in our home. Children are filled with joy and love and innocence and laughter and the things that adults lose as they grow older. Amen. Now, not every adult, but a lot of adults uh, seem like that they lose the reason of their joy. Uh, they don't laugh as much. Amen. They don't have as much fun. I'll tell you, friend, that the world can weigh heavy on your shoulders and it steals the you that are you and you're not able to be as happy as you would be. So I want to 
not make you childish today, but don't lose your childlikeness. Amen. Uh, Jesus had brought a child uh, when the people asked him who's the greatest in the kingdom of heaven, and he brought up a child and he said in front of them, and he said, Whosoever you that receiveth me as this little child greatest in the kingdom of God, meaning that we should be humble and childlike. Our faith should be wide and accepted of the things of God. And when we do that, we're owning our faith and what we believe in Jesus Christ. We talk about our faith and our trust in the Lord and how much we appreciate the things that God has done and getting rid of fear in our lives. And all of that really accounts to being able to trust who he said he was and is. He's not changed. Amen. And if a child can jump off a car into its parents' arm, we ought to be able to put our trust in God uh, that he's got every situation handled in our lives. All we've got to do is just trust him for who he say he is. Amen. And he'll be just exactly that in our lives. The other day I got to my destination in the truck I was driving to and the gospel song was on and I was just singing along with it. It had another verse to go with it. I so I just sat there and listened and didn't get out until I was done singing. Amen. And what was the song? You're all wondering, right? Amen. What was the song? Well, I'll tell you what it is. He trusts God in the little thing and pray to God in the little thing and he'll be there in the bigger things. Amen. And so I just enjoyed that song and I was done with my physical destination but I wasn't done with my spiritual destination. I love what that song tells about. Amen. Being able to trust God regardless what comes our way. It's a COVID, COVID virus. If it's the flu, if it's the loss of a job, if it's a terminal illness, if it's a divorce, whatever comes your way, trust God in it. Amen. Because he's got it under control. He's already got it handled. We need to bring our children up and, and cherish them and help them to flourish the gifts and the arts and the way that God had made them to nurture their faith and bring them out to the house of God. Amen. When they become adults themselves and have children, they'll be able to pass on uh, that faith. Amen. Wednesday night, uh, Brother Gary Crozier talked about uh, the thing, the statement that we make here in church about every uh, time uh, that we're just a generation from losing God in our homes. And I wonder this morning, how many people in the church had godly parents, or at least one godly parent, and then you had one godly grandparent, or a couple of godly grandparents. Then when you get married, and you've got in-laws with a godly heritage, amen? Isn't that wonderful that we can have the faith of Jesus Christ and pass it on from generation to generation? But then when kids get to a certain age, amen, and they stop going to church, in that generation, and I think about the time and day and age which we're living in, how many children have strayed away from God, and amen, in our time period, in this world today, I think about uh, the rioting and everything that's going on, and uh, this, I think about it like this, what kind of a home did they get brought up in? Amen. And where are they today in relationship to the way that they were brought up? Now, if you bring your children to church and you have them in Sunday school and you bring them to preaching and revivals and to singing, you bring them to the house of God, there's no guarantee that they're not going to go sour when they get up on their own. There's no guarantee. But my friend, you've got a greater guarantee that they'll go wrong if you don't. People say, where was God here? Where was God there? I say, where was God? I'll tell you where God was. He was right there waiting for you to trust him. Amen. And you didn't trust him. Yes. And you still expected him to come on the scene. Yes. Why is America in the shape that it's in? Because we told God to take a hike. Amen. 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 We told God we don't need him no more. Whereas the families and the situation in our home, parents have said, God, we don't need you. Just get out of our home, get out of our churches, get out of our school, get out of our government, get out of our lives. We're in a shape today in America because God's not at the center of everything that we do. He's not the center of our lives. 
the Bible has much to say about the children and bringing them up in the things of the Lord. Uh, the lines of scripture and the children gives us a guidance, amen. Uh, now, not everything that's going to happen in your child's life is spelled out for us in scripture, but he's given us guidelines to go by uh, so that we can have a, a record uh, that we can go to and we can get instruction and knowledge from that we might be able to bring them up and that they can laugh, that they can have joy, that they can have assurance, amen. They have peace, they can have rest, and they can have all the things uh, that they ought to have. And I like our Constitution, amen, that we are promised with the, uh, the uh, privileges of uh, life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness. Uh, all these things are guarantees to us in our Constitution. However, my friend, it's up to you to follow the teachings in our Constitution. And my friend, the same thing applies today. If you want the blessings that come from God's Word, get in it and allow it and follow it in your hearts and in your life. I want us to think about Matthew uh, chapter 19, a couple of verses of Scripture. Matthew chapter 19, verses 13, starting there. All right? And so the Bible says we're talking about children and uh, what a great uh, asset and a joy that they are to our home and to our families. He said this in Matthew 19, 13. Then were there brought unto him little children that he should put his hand on them and pray and the disciples rebuke them. Uh, but Jesus said, Suffer, meaning allow a little children and forbid them not to come unto me for of such is the kingdom of heaven. And he laid his hands on them and departed thence. Matthew, Mark, and Luke all record a small amount or to a degree of the exact same wording that is given to us in Matthew. And so it's important for us to understand uh, that we're to bring our children uh, to Jesus Christ. And that's the whole point that I'd like to make to you today, amen? Uh, these children were too young to come to Jesus on their own. Are you with me, parents? Amen. Are you with me today? These children were too young to bring themselves to Christ. But it was the parents' desire uh, to have Jesus, who was recognized as the Messiah, the Son of God, the anointed of God. It was his, uh, their desire, parents' desire, to bring their children to Jesus Christ, that he might touch them, that he might bless them, that he might pray for them, amen. And the disciples said, hey, don't do this uh, because the master's too important. The master's too busy. He doesn't have time for children. I'm glad that whenever the disciples uh, tried to forbid them, that Jesus said, suffer them to come, amen. Uh, amen, let them come. Encourage them to come. I think that's what he's got out there uh, that he's trying to tell them. And what I want for you to do is bring your children to Jesus, amen. It was something that they needed to do. The parents sought the blessing of Jesus upon their, or their lives, and that's what he said. They were brought unto him little children. Luke says infants. And so I'm looking at a children that's uh, uh, from the time of their birth and able to get out uh, and, and be to the temple at uh, the age when they're recognized to the Lord and a blessing was sought on them because of their birth and then up to the time of four or five or six or seven or eight, I'm not going to put a year limit on it. Now, friend, parents, at this time, now think about it like this, if you were for just a moment, and maybe a parent didn't know about the Messiah, didn't know about Jesus, didn't know about his teaching, and their kids already 10, 11, and 12. Well, they missed it, didn't they? He wasn't there at that time. So if I was a parent and I recognized that was the Messiah, Jesus was Messiah, I'd bring my 10, 11, and 12-year-old to Jesus and say, pray for my child. And the reason they did that because they sought the best for their child. Now, people today take their babies to the Pope or they'll stand up in a, a line when the Pope is passing by and hoping that they'll say, bless my child, bless my child, bless my child, uh, that the Pope will go like this and, and, and the child is blessed on another. 
Amen. Don't bring your child to me to bless them, but I'll pray for them. Amen. And I can't baptize an infant. It doesn't make any difference. Baptism shows identity with Christ. Until a person gets to the age of accountability, they have no identity with Jesus Christ. They are already innocent and protected as far as eternity is concerned up to the age of accountability. But when a child reaches the age of accountability, when they know right from wrong, when they know they're lost and need to be saved, when they know that Jesus Christ loved them and died for them on the cross, that child then needs to be saved. Amen. And up to that time, friend, we can dedicate a child only to parents that are dedicated to Jesus. Amen. I don't think it's a good thing that we say uh, we're going to dedicate a child and, and, and then obligate the parent uh, that's not saved. Controversy, amen, here on, on Family Sunday, amen, controversy. A, a parent that's not saved can't dedicate their child. And so bringing it before the church for the church to pray, the preacher to pray for that child does not dedicate that child. The parents must do the dedicating. Amen. We can pray for them. We can bless by prayer. We can pray by God's guidance. But in order for a child to have the blessing of the presence of God in his life, mom and dad, the male and the female, mom and dad, need to know Jesus Christ. I understand that children are troubled today in this world. I also understand, and I don't understand, I understand they don't bring them, but I don't understand why parents don't bring their children to church. <clears throat> huh? Yeah. Yeah. I don't get that. We do the best we can by our children in medicine. If your child is sick, you take it to the doctor. We do our best to go to the sports things. We want our children to be healthy. If they want to play basketball or football or tennis or Crocker or hockey or whatever that it is, we want them to be able to go, right? So we want medicine, we're going to make sure, we're going to make sure that they're physically there, we're going to send them to school, they get a good education, but when it comes to going to God's house, parents fall way short yes. of their obligation and not bringing them to the house of the Lord. My friend, remember, remember I talked about earlier about we're a uh, human being is a trifold individual, body, soul, and spirit. And we've got to do all three of those in order for that child to be well-rounded and mature. And if any of them is left out, then they suffer not being brought to the greatest them that they can be. I don't understand why people don't bring their children to church like they ought to. My friend, my, my thought, my idea, I think many of them just don't know. They weren't raised in church. So they don't have the knowledge to bring their children to church. But those that have been raised in church <coughs> have the knowledge that they need to bring their children to church and just don't do it. <coughs> don't you understand with me today that parents are going to stand before God on judgment day yes, yeah. as to whether they brought their children to the house of God or not. Yeah. I thank God for granting and grandmas and grandpas, don't you? Yes, yeah. I read uh, somewhere, and I don't remember the statistics, been a while, about how many uh, grandparents are raising their grandchildren uh, because the parents are not uh, available uh, because of drugs or alcohol or something. Now, death is one thing, but if we get over certain with, we get over troubled with, we get over encumbered by a, some kind of a device in this world and we forsake our families and our homes, then the fault is on that individual. Amen. And thank God for grandma and grandma that will step up and help out and bring them to the house of God. Amen. And they brought them to Jesus that he might pray for them. You know, we don't have the word in Jesus prayed. Jesus prayed a number of times in Scripture. Amen. Did he not? Yes. He prayed a lot in Scripture. But what did he pray for these children? The Bible says he didn't pray for them. He placed his hand on them. 
Now, placing the hand on, a, on an individual was a great Jewish thing. And it may have been in other religions. But they would often place their hands upon a person as they blessed them and prayed for them. I was part of the way that they did sacrifices. I, the elders and the chief priests and the different ones would place their hand on the animal that was being sacrificed. Uh, that times when they would bring the, the children and different ones by for a touching and a healing, uh, they would touch. Remember, Jesus got in trouble with the Pharisees because he touched the leper. And he touched people that were considered unclean. And so touching and blessing was a big part of Jesus' ministry in the Jewish community. It spilled over into the Christian church where today we touch one another. We, we pray for them. We anoint them with oil. According to James tells us we anoint them with oil. And so very much a part of it. And so, amen, Jesus prayed for them. Prayed for each, as I said before, unique individual human being for them. He prayed for them. He blessed them. He put his hand upon them. And how happy it should be for the assurance of the parents today to know that they brought their child to the Pope. No, brought their child to the pastor. No, but they brought their child to Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. They brought their child to Jesus so that he might bless them. And my friend, that takes place in the church. And yesterday, uh, A.W. Tozer, Aiden Wilson Tozer, had a little thing on Facebook about uh, uh, communing together, being in church together, and the little devotion that I was reading. And uh, there was a, a couple of people that wrote down there, what's the big deal with the church? What's the big deal with the church? What's the big deal with congregating? And why is it that Sunday is the day that people congregate and everybody, it seemed like a, 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 lot, a number of them below, tried to explain what was unique about Sunday and what was special about the church. And there were some of them that just didn't get it. I'll tell you, friend, there is nobody that is so blind as he that just will not see. One of the persons finally said, I believe all you want to do is argue for argument's sake and I'm done. I'll tell you this, friend, I'm not going to argue with you on this. I'll simply tell you that God desires and commands you to come to church and for you to bring your children and your families to church. I love the Philippian jailer. After he got saved, the first thing he did was include his family. Amen? Family is the greatest institution in the world. It's the first thing that God did in the Garden of Eden. It's the first thing that the devil tried to destroy. Amen. The government might be the second best, but the family is the first best thing in God's eyes. That's why the devil is trying to destroy the family. He hates the family. What did I mention the last Sunday or so? That if the devil can destroy the family, he'll destroy the nation. <laughs> Our children live in a, a dangerous world. Any questions? Our children live in a dangerous world. Uh, epidemics, pandemics, all these different things, the violence, uh, the different uh, cultural, religious things that are in America today, all of them undermining our Judeo-Christian morals, all of them trying to change America today. Our children live in a very violent world and it's the parents' obligation to bring them to Jesus, amen, in a world that's filled up with trouble. If Jesus is not their friend, they don't have one. They don't have a friend that's going to stand with them in their heartache. A friend that will stand with them in the time of their trouble and desolation. A friend that will not be there when it stands in, in the time of judgment. My friend, if Jesus is not your friend, you need to think about that. How many parents have ever had another kid say, can Johnny come over to my house tonight? Do you know Johnny's parents? Does it make you a little bit nervous? I didn't let my boy just run off with anybody. I didn't know who those parents were. Amen! I didn't know what was going on over the other homes and families. 
I wanted to make sure that I had some idea what they would be exposed to. God knocked their friend. They have no friend. One that's going to keep them in a time of trouble. With proper feelings. Amen. And a parent that will raise their child up in the house of God and bring them to church. Whenever they get older, they'll run to the throne of grace on their own. Amen. Amen. They'll already know that that's the place for me. My heart is broken and my life is troubled. I'm going to God's altar. I'm going to find me, Jesus, at the altar. Amen. Parents need to raise their children so that they got a role model of following Jesus. Yeah. And they can go to Him. Satan's going to destroy your child if he's at all possible. Yeah. Is your child a Christian? Satan's working his best to destroy your child. To destroy, I'm telling you, make ruin of them so that they don't go to heaven. That's the only hope that the devil's got to overthrow the kingdom of God. To stop people from getting saved. We should never forget that these parents sought the favor of God. And that if we are right thinking parents, we're going to seek the favor of God. And his blessing for our children. Amen. Amen. Offer to them in prayer to God. From the very first. As soon as they get old enough. After the few days of birth. And you feel comfortable with that child. And that child is healthy. And you can bring it to church. Bring it to church. Bring that baby to Jesus. I don't know. It may be not dedicated that day. May not be dedicated a week after that. May not be dedicated a month after that. But you bring that baby just as soon as it's able to get to the house of God. To the house of God. Let it grow up in God. Because the devil is going to do his best to stop it. Isaiah 54 and 3. And all thy children shall be taught of the Lord. And great shall be the peace of thy children. And all thy children shall be taught of the Lord. And great shall be the peace of thy children. I tell you, when you raise your child up in the house of God, they'll have a peace that the rest of the world doesn't yes. know and doesn't understand. Amen. We're to bring our children up in the fear and admonition of the Lord. A couple of verses real quick. Proverbs chapter 1. Let me start reading with... Uh, verse 5, a wise man will hear, will increase learning. A man of understanding shall attain unto wise counsel to understand a proverb and the interpretation of the words of the wise and their dark saying. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. Verse 8 and 9 are very important in this uh, passage I'm reading. My son, hear the instruction of thy father. Forsake not the law of thy mother. For they shall be an ornament of grace under thy head and chains about thy neck. My son, if sinners entice thee, consent thou not. If somebody tries to get you to go down a wrong path that your parents didn't teach you was good, don't go. If they come, say, come with us. Let us lay, wait for blood. Let us store privily for the innocent without cause. Let us swallow them up alive as the grave and whole as those that go down the pit. We shall find all precious something. We shall fill our houses with spoil. Cast in thy lot among us. Let us all have one purse. My son, walk not thou in the way with them. Refrain thy foot from their path. Amen. Parents, it's up to us to show them that that's not a good path to go. He said there that we would have... Uh, my son, hear the instruction of thy father. Verse 8, forsake not the law of thy mother. Bring them up with that understanding. Here's what I expect out of you, my son. Here's what I expect out of you, my daughter. This is the instruction from the Word of God, and I expect you to know it and to live by it. We need to give them some expectations. Kids grow up today with no borders. Kids grow up today with no boundaries. So they don't know what they can and can't get away with. And because of that, they'll do anything they want to. That's why our world is full of violence today. Train up a child in the way he should go, Proverbs 22. When he is old, he will not depart from it. Psalms 127. Now this could be the temple. It could be a city. 
or it could be a family. Psalm 127. It doesn't make any difference which one they are. The meaning is the same. Except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman waketh, but in vain. It is vain for you to rise up early, to sit up late, to eat the bread of sorrow, for so he give his beloved sleep. Lo, children are an heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward. As arrows in the hand of a mighty man, so are the are children of the youth. Happy is the man that hath this quiver, which is a, a stockpile of ammunition. Uh, a quiver is a thing where a, a man would keep his arrows ready for his bow, and so that would be strung across his back. And so happy is the man that has his quiver, his arrows easy to reach, his weapons, his catch of uh, ability to protect <coughs> arrows in the head of a mighty man, so are the children of the youth. Happy the man that hath his quiver full of them, they shall not be ashamed. They shall speak with the enemies in thy gate and not be afraid. The devil is your enemy. And if you raise your child in the fear and admonition of the Lord, you'll not be afraid of that enemy. Amen. Psalm 139. <laughs> 13. For thou hast possessed my reins. Thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise thee for I am fearlessly and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works and that my soul knoweth right well. My substance was not hid from thee when I was made in secret and curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Mine eyes did see my substance yet being unperfect and in thy book all my members were written, which in continuance were fashioned, even as yet there was none of them. Friend, this psalmist is talking about him as an unborn baby in the womb. He is an infant child that has not yet come to birth. He is saying that I was... I will praise him, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. My friend, you are a human being of the moment of conception. You are God uh, devised a person whose eyes are not perfect, whose limbs are not perfect, whose organs are not perfect. They're still being processed and made during the time of the womb carrying, but you are still a human being at that point in the womb and doctors and hospitals and nurses and abortion clinics are killing human beings by the millions. Amen. 46 million have been killed since Roe versus Wade. 46 million potential doctors, lawyers, nurses, presidents, statesmen, preachers, preachers' wives, gospel singers, 46 some million did not have the opportunity to be what God would have them be because their lives were snuffed out before they were able to take that first breath of air. You think about our country and the violence that is in, you think about the violence by these human beings that have come to the nine month period and beyond and they're living. Is there any doubt that all of these people in the church and in the world today are living human beings? There's no doubt in my mind that that baby that's conceived in the womb, having not yet come out to life, is a human being. Amen. You will not convince me of anything else. We might call them a, uh, a fetal uh, person, amen, not yet come to life. We might give them any term that science wants to name to take away their humanity, but a baby that's conceived in the womb is a human being. And they are fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. Amen. In, in the uh, person of who they are before they're born, they are an innocent human being that God has placed on this earth. The Bible tells us in Jeremiah chapter 1 and verse 5, God had a plan for Jeremiah before he was born. 
Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee. And I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. God had a plan for Jeremiah before he ever was born. I'll tell you, friend, in fact, God had a plan for Jeremiah before he said, let there be light. God already knew Jeremiah before that time. As a human being, as an individual with potential, according to the Psalmist 139, a soul, all these things are real and a part of it. I'm going to close with these thoughts. In 2014, the abortion rate was about one in four. About every lady or woman that got uh, pregnant, uh, one out of four aborted that baby. Those women will have an abortion by age 45. A number of them by the age of 45. Can you imagine being 45 years of age? And having known what life is and how precious that it is and still abort a baby. 17% of abortion patients in 2014 identified them as mainline Protestant. 17% identified themselves as mainline Protestant. That's Episcopal, Lutheran, a United Methodist, United Church of Christ. There are also 13% of evangelical Protestants. That's those who believe you've got to be born again. Southern Baptists, Free Will Baptists, uh, people of, along the lines of the Church of God. Uh, some 17% or 14% uh, identify themselves as evangelical Christians. 24% is Catholic. 38% re reported no religious affiliation. I'll tell you, friend, if you don't identify with any God and you commit a, 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 an abortion, you don't have no thought about it, you have no conscience about it, that's just another clump of matter. It makes no difference. I can understand that better than I can a Christian. Someone that calls themselves a Christian killing a baby. I cannot imagine a doctor taking the hypocritical oath and suffer no wrong and to kill an innocent human being. 38% no, uh, no affiliation re, re, with religion. Remaining 8% reported some other affiliation. The mass majority, 94% of abortion patients in 2014 identified themselves as heterosexual or straight. 94% of abortion patients in 2014 believed in the heterosexual or straight lifestyle. Whether married or not married, 94% considered themselves straight that had an abortion, of those that had an abortion. 4% of the patients said they were bisexual. They could swing either way. Three-tenths of a percent. Identified as homosexual, gay, or lesbian. 1% identified as something else. I thought that covered everybody. <laughs> Evidently not. Something else. A snapshot of the yearly numbers since 1970. And understand the CDC has given a lot of these numbers. The Center for Disease Control give these numbers. According to the Gut Mocker Organization, uh, the CDC's numbers are wrong. Way wrong. According to the CDC, 1970, 193,491 babies were aborted. Since Roe versus Wade in 1973, 615,831 babies were aborted. 1980, 1,297,606 babies were aborted. In 1990, 1 million 429,247 babies were aborted. I'm talking about just the numbers in the United States of America. In the year 2000, 857,475 babies were aborted. What happened? The numbers went down. 
Do you know that because of our standing up and giving more of a voice as the church, the numbers of abortions have gone down significantly? Nowhere near enough, but they're on a decline. In uh, 2017, they had the lowest number of abortions since they kept record. And yet from October 1st, uh, 2017 to September 30th, 2018, they had the highest yearly rate of abortions ever recorded. According to the Guttmacher Institution, 19, uh, 2017, 862,320. From 1970 to two, uh, 2017, 46,413,319 babies have been aborted. During the COVID-19 uh, period, our government has declared that abortion is an essential health care. Our lawmakers, Democrats, I hate to say that, it saddens me to say that any politician, that any right-thinking parent, that anybody in authority, that anybody in the closet would say that abortion equals health care. He said, I heard him. Abortion equals health care. But only for half of the patients. The other half are open field hunting to be killed. Does that not sadden you like it does me? read those numbers, I think about the number of people that have died in war and they don't even touch 46 million, almost 46 and a half million in 2017. We're three years past that. We're almost a half a year into this year and that number's got to be closer to 47, 48 million that have been killed by abortion. Abortion is essential health care. And this is on the G-U-T-T-M-A-C-H-E-R dot org site. Abortion is essential health care. Now that's what, what's going on. That's what they say. That's what our politicians say. And Guttmeyer I'm pronouncing it correctly. Put a period there and then added the word always. Not just during the uh, epidemic, but always. Abortion is essential. Healthcare, always. Blows my mind. We talked to a man the other day. Uh, I want to say Thursday. I talked to him and we were talking about uh, our world and the situation is in. And I'll tell you, friend, as I mentioned Wednesday night, our world is ripe. The United States is ripe for judgment. Yep, amen. I think it's been said, not just by me, but by others, uh, that, a, that a, any government's first obligation is to protect the innocent. Elderly, our, our mental uh, people that are limited, to protect those that are not able to protect themselves. Our government's first obligation is to protect its citizens. Unless you're a baby in the womb. As great a blessing as children are. I cannot imagine my life without my three boys. Amen. The joy, the challenge. I can't imagine my life without my grandchildren. For 
Friday, I got to play a little bit with my great grandchild. I can't imagine anybody killing them. If one of your children was killed, it would rip your heart out, right? And yet that innocent baby in the womb, people don't even think about it. We need to pray for our country. We need to pray for America. I'm not going to ask for an altar call this morning, but I'm going to ask for everybody to come. And let's pray for our country.